Okay, so now we move on to uh, antimycobacteria. So this is always sort of a very, very fun lecture or topic. Not really. It's a little confusing. It's, you know, not really the most fun to learn. And there's just, there's a lot of little things. So we're going to try to break it down as easy as we can and give you the best information. And hopefully it'll make uh, learning about TB a little bit better. So starting off with a few questions, a 33-year-old immigrant comes from Peru to a woman's health clinic because she has missed her period for the past two months. This is actually one of my favorite questions. When her pregnancy test comes back positive, she is distraught, saying that she has been taking oral contraceptive pills for the past year and has not missed a single dose. As she starts to cry, her tears are noted to have an orange tint. I, come on, guys. I know you know this. The physician tells her that the most likely reason her oral contraceptives were ineffective is an interaction with one of her other medications. What is the mechanism of action of the drug that the patient is most likely taking? So this is sort of a very classic, classic question that they can ask about TB. And one of the drugs that's commonly used for TB, it ties a few concepts together. But like this is, this is a, a one of my favorite questions. And if you were paying attention, the very last slide we talked about, it sort of ties a concept in that we were just talking about. So what is the mechanism of action of the drug the patient is most likely taking? If you picked A, a drug that blocks RNA synthesis by inhibiting DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is rifampin, you are correct. Rifampin, as we'll talk about, is another SIP inducer, so it's going to increase the metabolism of the patient's oral contraceptive pills. And in addition, the way you know that it's rifampin specifically and not some other drug is because the patient is crying uh, orange tears, one of the side effects of rifampin. So it's sort of a very, in my mind, I think it's a very, very cool way to tie in a couple side effects and uh, ask about a mechanism of action. All right. Another very, very important uh, question in TB. 26-year-old recent immigrant from China presents to the emergency department with a three-week history of fevers accompanied by night sweats and chills and weight loss. So in the very beginning, we're thinking TB. A cough is uh, often productive with a blood-tinged blood sputum. Bronchioalveolar lavage is performed and an acid fast stain of the samples reveals an organism. So for those of you who don't know, this is... You know, this is an acid fast stain uh, bacteria. This is most likely tuberculosis. Which of the following should be included in the patient's therapy to prevent a common toxicity of treatment? So this, again, goes back to knowing that the drug, or that this is TB. What are some of the drugs that we use? And what is a common toxicity of one of the drugs that is used to treat TB? And the answer is pyridoxine or B6. B6 is a uh, deficiency. is a common, common, common side effect of uh, isoniacid treatment in uh, TB. Last but not least, 57-year-old male presents to the ED with fevers, night sweats, and a productive cough with occasional hemoptysis. Immediately, we're thinking TB. Even, even if we weren't doing a section on TB, we'd be thinking TB. He has started on empiric he started empirically on several medications for his underlying disease. After a follow-up several months later, he reports difficulty reading the paper in the morning and has been found to wear unusual color combinations at work. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's new symptoms? This is another another classic question because of the classic side effect of one of the drugs that is used to treat TB. And it's a little more straightforward, but the answer is ethambutol. You just have to know that ethambutol, one of the side effects is uh, visual disturbances, color, visual color disturbances. All right, so how is mycobacteria different from our cells? You know, as you all know, mycobacteria has mycolic acid in its cell wall. These are longer chain fatty acids. This is why they act the way they do, these mycobacteria, this is why we have the acid fast stain, and this is why we have to treat them a different way, because this uh, mycolic acid acts a little bit different. There is also arabinoglactam, uh, another type of 
uh, I believe, cholesterol in the cell wall, and then there's pepsinoglycan. So we have two different, um, or just three sort of uh, ways that we can sort of attack the mycobacteria cell wall that's a little bit different than our own cells. So how do we facilitate killing mycobacteria? One way is to inhibit mycolic acid synthesis, and this is done through the use of isoniazid. We can inhibit arano arabinoglactan polymerization. This is through this is thought to be through amphambutol. We can inhibit transcription, inhibiting mRNA synthesis through rifampin, and then we can also actually not inhibit transcription, but we can inhibit protein synthesis through some aminoglycosides. Something that's not quite done as much for mycobacteria treatment anymore. We can, in addition, uh, inhibit new base synthesis through inhibiting folic acid folic acid synthesis uh, using Bactrim, sulfamethoxazole, or or, and uh, trimethoprim, and Dapsone. We can also inhibit uh, DNA unwinding through fluoroquinolones. And then finally, you know, there's always, a, there's always one drug that's just unknown, and we don't know how it works, and that's pyrazinamide. So there are three organisms that we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about mycobacteria tuberculosis. We're going to talk about MAC, or mycobacteria mavium complex, and we're going to also talk about mycobacteria leprae. So this is just uh, something I sort of never understood, so I I don't know, maybe it's like a narcissistic thing, but like if I don't understand it, and like, oh, maybe other people don't, but regardless, I figured I'd put it up here anyway, just to sort of help you differentiate between primary TB and secondary TB. Primary TB, you know, you have your initial infection, you have your hyalur nodes that are uh, enlarged, and you have your GON focus, both of those being the GON complex. Most people, 90% of people, that heals up and you become, you know, you're fine. You're tuberculin positive, but you don't have tuberculosis in the sense that you're not suffering from this infection. 10%, uh, you know, progresses to primary. Uh, primary progressive, uh, you know, mostly in AIDS patients, malnutrition, somebody who's immune compromised. If then you have a reactivation because of some reason, some sort of infection, some other kind of immunocompromisation, inability to house it, the bacteria, you have an, an upper lobe fibrocaseous cavitary lesion. And this is usually how it presents and what you see in most patients. You see them coming in, the fevers, chills, and then they take an x-ray and you see this lesion in the uh, right or left upper lobe. That can progress to systemic infection in the meninges, the vertebrae, the spleen, adrenal glands, bone, or it can just be locally destructive. All right, so let's get to some of the drugs that are used in TB. So, uh, two of the bigger ones, rifampin or rifibutin and isoniazid. So, rifampin, this is the one we talked about before. This is our DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Very important to remember that. It is a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So this is inhibiting transcription. It's used for many different things in addition to TB and leprosy. It can be used for uh, Haemophilus influenza B prophylaxis. If you were not in, if you were not, did you, if you didn't get the Hib vaccine and you were exposed, it can also very commonly tested question be used to treat patients who are exposed to Neisseria meningitis prophylaxis. If you remember from that sketchy micro sketch, there's the rifampin rifle. Rifibutin is a cousin that has less drug interactions and is preferred in HIV patients. I've never seen it in a question. It's just one of those things you have to know. Rifampin is the one that's commonly used. Rifibutin is its cousin with less drug interactions preferred in HIV patients. Side effects. Before I go over all of them, the main ones we talked about before, the red-orange color excreted fluids, urine, sweat, and tears. You have to know, rifampin causes the red-orange color of the fluids. Very commonly tested, I showed you in that other question, it's a way that they sort of use, like to identify rifampin. And then, interestingly enough, it ties into that question again, which is why we included it. We really liked it because there was also the... It, it, it helped explain the concept of it is another inducer of the CYP450 system, so it can decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. Again, if you induce the CYP450 system, 
you're going to have more metabolism of your drugs. So if there are drugs that need constant levels checked, you're going to have lowering of those levels and you're going to get outside of the therapeutic window. Very highly tested concept is rifampin is an inducer. In addition, because we're inhibiting transcription, obviously we can have some of our rapidly growing cells you know, shrink in size. So thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and anemia. It can also, interestingly enough, cause hyperbilirubinemia. Wouldn't worry so much about that one. Um, it can also cause nephritis and proteinuria. But the biggest things for rifampin is the orange-colored uh, fluids, and it is an inducer. In addition, sometimes we like to talk about resistance. Uh, the way that rifampin is, you know, the way that uh, mycobacteria becomes resistant to rifampin is sometimes there are mutations to the RNA polymerase so that the rifampin can't bind to it anymore and inhibit it. Isoniazid, another extremely important NTTB drug. As we said before, this one inhibits mycolic acid synthesis. It's primarily only used for TB. It is metabolized by histone acetylation. So patients can be fast or slow acetylators. Now that's something, I've talked about this before. We thought pharmacogenetics was gonna be this big thing and we were gonna be able to take your DNA and figure out the perfect drug to use for different treatments. Did not pan out. It is something though that loves to be tested because you know the examiners wanna get into theory and they wanted to get into book smarts and all this crap, but you know, don't worry too much about the fast or slow acetylators. Sometimes they just like to ask, how is isoniazid metabolized? And because it's metabolized a little bit differently through histone acetylation, just know that. Side effects, lots and lots of side effects of isoniazid that you have to know. B6 neuropathy, so hit sideroblastic anemia, and then seizures. So those are a big three things that are all related to B6, talk, B6, low B6 that you have to remember. Isoniazid will actually cause the lowering of B6 uh, pyridoxine. So it, that can lead to neuropathy, that can lead to seizures, and then that can also lead to sideroblastic anemia. Sideroblastic anemia being the anemia where you have your red blood cells and you can actually see that there are, I believe it's, um, if you look at red blood cell precursors in the bone marrow, you can see the lines around them. So very important to remember, isoniazid causes B6 deficiency and that can lead to neuropathy, seizures, and sideroblastic anemia. Isoniazid in and of itself is very hepatotoxic. It can also cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis. If you remember your mud piles mnemonic, it is one of the eyes in addition to iron. And it can also cause a drug-induced lupus. Anti, uh, this, is found, you, this will cause, the isoniazid will actually cause antihistone antibodies. And that's sort of how we get our drug-induced lupus. That's what you would test for. The resistance is created by intracellular catalase peroxidase. So resistance is a decreased activity of this enzyme. And because there's a decreased activity of this enzyme, it's pretty much figured out a way to make my, it, it's figured out a way to make mycolic acid through a different mechanism. Side note, what other drugs can cause drug-induced lupus? Uh, hydralazine isoniazid, and procanamide. So just before we move on, if, uh, you know, if you're at a crunch for time and you don't have as much time to remember everything about the anti-TB drugs, I would say you have to you know, memorize these two. These two are the highest yield and, and just it's so important. Now, last two, pyrazanamide. As I talked about before, this is one of our unknowns. Apparently, I think I picked this up from one of the pharmacology textbook. It works in an acidic environment, creating a phagolysosome, you know, somehow. I, I wouldn't worry too much about piranazinamide. It's as part of the uh, rifampin ripe. Sorry, it is part of the TB 
treatment ripe, uh, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. Just know that it's part of the major four. It is another hepatotoxic drug. However, if you had to pick between isoniazid and pyrazinamide, I would pick isoniazid as being the, the reason that a patient is having hepatotoxicity. Ethambutol, this is inhibiting arabinazole transferase, which is polymerizing and creating arabinoglycan, arabinoglycan. So I would know that specifically. It is also a part of RIPE. And the big thing here is it can lead to optic neuropathy or red-green color blindness or just visual disturbances. Ethambutol inhibits arabinosyl transferase. It is a part of RIPE and it can cause optic neuropathy, red-green color blindness, or uh, visual disturbances. Very, very important. There are a few second-line agents. Streptomycin, which is our aminoglycoside, which we've talked about previously, and some fluoroquinolones, such as Cipro or Levo, which, again, we've talked about previously. Uh, you can also use some third-line agents like uh, P-aminosalicylic acid, which is a folic acid blocking agent. You can use athenamide, another mycolic acid blocking agent, or cyclosyrene, which is inhibiting cell walls. Uh, I wouldn't worry about really any of those three. If we're going to be asked a TB question, it's going to be about RIPE. So, some of the different specific treatments for different uh, uh, mycobacteria. So for microbacteria leprae or leprosy, you mostly want to know dapsone. So dapsone is another folic acid antagonist. It's used for both type 1 and type 2 forms of microbacteria leprae. Uh, it can also be used for PCP or PJP if the patient has a sulfa allergy. And dapsone is one of our friends that has that uh, hemolysis with G6PD deficiency. Uh, if you remember way back to uh, biochemistry, G6PD deficiency, and I think you guys just took, uh, uh, you just did the um, hematinic lecture. You just did all, studied all of those micro and macro acidic anemias. Our micro acidic anemia, G6PD deficiency is very, you know, common. You have the African-American male who comes over and he's having fava beans and he's jaundice. Dapsone is sort of another stimulant of somebody with G6P deficiency to be having a hemolytic crisis. Some other drugs used in leprosy, uh, rifampin and clofazamine. Finally, we have MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex. This is another one of the ones that you're going to have to memorize eventually that's an AIDS-defining illness. And the big thing to remember is each one of them has a CD4 count, at which point if the patient has a CD4 count below a certain level, you have to prophylax for this specific infection. The uh, CD4 count that you have to know for MAC is less than 50, and I believe that's the lowest one. So, you know, CD4 less than 50, you got to prophylax for MAC, azithromycin. So that's what I would know. MAC, it's an AIDS-defining illness. If you have less than a CD4, if you have a CD4 count of less than 50, you must treat your patient for it or prophylax the patient for it. You use azithromycin. Now, uh, some additional information. So for treating uh, specifically mycobacterium tuberculosis, active mycobacterium, you have to be aware that uh, because mycobacteria is so contagious, you know, if we have patients who have this, we put them in a negative pressure room, you know, it is, you know, we're doing everything we can to try to contain it. And you might have also heard that, you know, in some areas of Russia and other countries, you know, we ha are starting to have mycobacteria that is extremely drug resistant or extra resistant. We have the multi-drug and then we have extra drug. So to treat the to, you know, to control this from becoming more of a, a problem in the United States is we have directly observed treatment. Patients will come in and we will actually observe them take their medications every day. First line for active TB is RIPE. Rifampin, isoniazid, uh, uh, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazanamide, and ethambutol. For multi-drug resistance, 
We can use higher dose ripe, and then we can also add on aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones. For extra drug resistant, we use some of these extra drugs that I didn't get into because it's really, I want you to just know that they're used for extra drug resistant. Athanamide, cycloserine, or P-aminosalicylic acid. In some patients who come in with just having latent TB, you can actually just give them rifampin for four months and isoniazid for nine months. There's a way of uh, treating this. You can have a patient come in, you treat them with RIPE for two months, and then you test them. And after that point, depending on how they're responding to treatment, you can actually discontinue pyrazinamide and ethambutol and just continue RIPE or just continue rifampin and isoniazid. But that's sort of beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. I talked about MAC before. It's uh, first line is azithromycin, and you can also use ethambutol and rifibutin. And then as we talked about before with mycobacteria leprae, tuberculoid type, uh, we can use dapsone and rifampin. And then lepromidus type, a little bit more serious, we can use dapsone, rifampin, and clavazamine. Okay, so, you know, for TB, what I really want you to know is I want you to remember RIPE. I want you to remember the mechanism of action and the side effects of the medications that are used in RIPE. In addition, you should know that azithromycin is sort of the first line for MAC. That tends to be asked quite a bit. 